All right, everybody. Welcome to another Road Reflection. I'm your host, Chris Mo, and thank you for tuning in wherever you're tuning in from, whenever you're tuning in from. Uh, very excited to, to, to be back. We're doing a little bit of an old format. Going a little old old school on this uh, on this road reflection here. Uh, I normally would do some live streams, um, or I would do like a premiere with this thing, uh, but uh, I, there's a lot of stuff going on. So uh, and with the Citizen Revolution shows and things of that sort, um, and working on uh, all of that content, uh, doing the premiere just didn't 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 fit in with the schedule so I hope that's cool with you guys um, it doesn't mean that I'm not uh, paying attention to the comments so I would very much encourage you guys to leave comments on this video make sure that you hit the like button hit the share button uh, make sure that you're subscribed to the channel subscribe to the page to make sure that you guys get updates when I put up new videos like this I'll probably try to do this format um, a little bit more uh, but, uh, like I said, I know this is not a premiere. I know this is not a live video that we're doing. Um, and it's just mostly a, a, a scheduling situation, uh, for me, uh, to make sure that I have time to put this content out for you guys, but also have time to, uh, you know, essentially take care of, uh, take care of, take care of the old Krish, uh, take care of things that I need to take care of as well. Um, so, so I hope you guys are cool with that. Uh, we're still going to do the same type of content here where we're going to look at some news stories that probably fell through the cracks that I didn't have time to write about. Uh, so we'll rant about it a little bit. That's the plan here. That's what we do on these videos. And uh, usually we do a check-in at the top of the episode, so that's going to be no different there. Um, like I said, my schedule is pretty, um, pretty full. I'm trying to take some time. Uh, for myself, some personal time to, you know, uh, enjoy things that I would normally enjoy and not uh, not get bogged down with all of the things, that, all, all of work-related things. So as much as I do enjoy the work that I'm doing, so things are going pretty good. I'm pretty excited about the state of things. Uh, the Citizen Revolution shows are going really, really well. Um, last night, July 10th, that was uh, one of the biggest shows that, that I've done so far. Uh, a lot of new people, a lot of uh, regulars that came, came, out, came out to see pretty much every single one of these shows. Um, and the ticket sales were great, and we, and we d made a, a good amount of money for the Tidewater DSA. Um, and that's one of the things I'm doing with these Citizen Revolution shows that I'm excited about, which is partnering with a grassroots movement, grassroots organization, journalist, things of that sort. Um, so we've got... Uh, Next week, July 17th, that's another Citizen Revolution show that's coming up. There's the poster for it. That's the Citizen Revolution poster. Uh, so we have July 17th, August 7th, August 14th, and August 28th. Um, and uh, they'll probably be going well into the fall and into the winter time as well as um, I don't particularly see... Um, the pandemic being taken care of anytime soon. And I think this year in terms of touring um, and, and really in terms of a lot of different types of live events are um, are going to be kind of null and void. Uh, so uh, these virtual shows are kind of how I'm making a living um, along with any sort of donations and sustaining memberships and album sales that I make. Um, really, these are the way that I'm, I'm going about doing things. So if you if you're into that sort of thing, if you're into um, seeing live performance in in a slightly different capacity, this is this is the show for you. So I encourage you guys to get tickets. Plus, you'll be helping out some grassroots organizations along the way. So that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. Um, you know, so and writing for those has given me a little bit of a schedule to work on. Like usually, my uh, Mondays are like my big research days where I do all of the research for the topic at hand, uh, the stories that I'm going to cover when I cover like shorter stories and stuff, which hasn't been really happening re in, in the recent shows, to be honest. Um, but I think this next week I will probably end up doing that. Um, I'm, I'm, my, my thought is that one of the things I've wanted to cover was, uh, and this has been on the, on my mind for a long time. And I did do a video about it. Um, maybe back in April or something along those lines is, um, is what what happened with West Virginia being this bastion of 
uh, you know, the, the, the spirit of the labor movement, essentially. And now we kind of think them think of them as as, you know, ignorant, lesser than kind of folks. What the fuck happened? And uh, there's a lot of great research out there. Uh, in regards to this, specifically with uh, the Battle at Blair Mountain, the labor movement in Blair Mountain, and my friend Eleanor Goldfield has uh, released a movie called Hard Road of Hope. Um, and there's a ton of other things that are going out there. So to me, if I concentrate on, on just the history of that, it, it'll probably be like 30, 40 minutes or something along those lines. But who the fuck knows? I, I write like a maniac, so maybe it won't be. And you know, so um, that's sort of the plan for for the July 17th show. Uh, and then I might add a couple of little little tiny stories and little tiny segments that I will release um, as uh, as videos as well. So um, and, and I think I mentioned this before is the the Citizen Revolution, the, the, the longer chunks of those shows do end up becoming episodes of Forkful of Noodles. So that way I'm I'm combining two things into one, essentially, so that I don't lose my brain. Um, other than that, you know, p uh, personal life stuff is going really well. Uh, very happy on that front. Um, I'm finding time to relax. I've got some uh, cool, fun activities that I'm doing. And, uh, yeah, all in all, all in all, things are going pretty, pretty well. I'm excited. I'm excited, uh, <laughs> I'm excited about... Um, the things that are coming down the pipeline, uh, the dispatches and stuff. So Mondays are usually research days. Tuesdays are my big writing days where I concentrate on writing the first draft of everything, uh, which includes the dispatches that I'm doing, the extended dispatch and the regular dispatch. So I try to write the first draft of jokes that day. So those are really the two like major work days for me where I'm spending like 10 to 12 hours doing a bunch of stuff. Um, and then Wednesday is basically me editing all of these pieces. It's putting up the uh, Taboo Table Talk for, the, for, for Wednesday. Um, same thing on Thursday. And then Thursday, I also put together the presentation um, that, uh, that I do on, on, on Fridays, right? Uh, so those are, that's kind of the, the, the way that I... And then Friday is usually the show. And then Saturday, I'm trying to do... Saturday and Sunday, I'm trying to do these live streams, um, take care of some emails, uh, take care of uploading things to to the YouTube pages, get ahead on my uploads and things of that sort. So now having that schedule has been uh, pretty fucking great, you guys. <laughs> so um, I am I am in in uh, a better place, uh, all things considered. So uh, yeah, uh, that's that's sort of uh, the check in. I'm in a, a pretty good positive space. So once again, if you guys do want to come check out those uh, virtual comedy shows. They, the tickets are available for those now uh, on my website, the newly rebranded com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, so go check it out there. All right, let's get to... I have three stories for you guys today. Uh, they're they're probably going to be shorter, and I'm hopefully going to be able to get get through these without any sort of... It's too much sidetracking and all that sort of stuff. So let's dive into it. Our first story involves a uh, war profiteer, Northrop Grumman, uh, who is falsely accused CIA whistleblower John Kiriakou of revenge porn. Um, and the chaos that has ensued in, uh, in John Kiriakou's life. Uh, John Kiriakou, for, for those of you that might not be in the know about who he is, uh, I would highly recommend you get to know who John is. Um, John is a CIA whistleblower. He uh, went to prison for, for blowing the whistle uh, on, uh, on, on unconstitutional spying and things of that sort. Uh, he ha is the host of uh, Loud and Clear on Sputnik Radio, a program that I I normally would listen to when I was on the road. I haven't particularly been listening to it all that much because it's hard to for me, this is a personal thing for me, it's hard to digest, like, audio-only content. Um, like, I have Lee Camp and Graham Elwood's new podcast. Uh, they put out an episode of it, and uh, I am, like, dragging my feet on getting through it. I think I've gotten through, like, half of it in two listens. Uh, Eleanor Goldfield has another audio podcast called Act Out that she releases every two weeks, and even that I'm behind on. It's Audio content is just really difficult for me to... Um, to absorb when I am uh, when I'm sitting at the computer most of the time, 
And when I go on my walks and when I go and do like workout stuff, like I, listening to music gets me more amped up. So it's still difficult for me to do that. Um, and what I, what I really should do is start listening to them again on my drives. Like I go on drives once or twice a week uh, just to like do that. So maybe I'll start doing that again. Uh, but it's just been really difficult. But I used to listen to Loud and Clear all the time. And um, uh, he also writes for Consortium News. And I've gone through some of the stuff that John has written for Consortium News. Uh, we talked about the crazy laws that are still in place uh, in the United States for whatever fucking reason. Right. Uh, so uh, John's going, you know, through through a divorce. And that's an unfortunate thing for, a, for to go to. It's a difficult process, depending on uh, what state you're in and the mental, physical states of both parties involved. And, you know, it's not a fun process to go through. But basically, um, he went to uh, Northrop Grumman, where his ex-wife works, and uh, brought up um, the fact that she was misappropriating funds to the ethics department at Northrop Grumman, just which is like something that, you know, yeah, okay, somebody's misappropriating funds, um, and it involved her uh, infidelity with, you know, the and things of that sort, and uh, he, he basically said, you guys should investigate this and that's the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, like he didn't do anything illegal in that front. He didn't do anything crazy or over the top in that front. He did the right thing. And so, of course, the ethics department went straight to his ex-wife, told her about it. And things got crazier from there where, where then uh, Northrop Grubin essentially filed charges against him. Um, and his ex-wife was involved as well, uh, claiming that, you know, he is trying to he's trying to use revenge porn as a as a as a means to um, to get his way in, in so to speak. Right. Uh, and which is crazy. It's crazy. Like uh, going up and saying, hey, these funds were misappropriated. Um, and it and it has to do with, you know, uh, these these unfortunate divorce proceedings that, that I'm going through. Um, and then for them to come out and say, oh, we're going to charge you with this felony crime um, with absolutely no proof because there is no proof coming out and saying that here's some financial shit. Uh, so. Here's what the complaint said. So let's go to the complaint. The complaint says right here. I'll highlight it, it says, according to the complaint. Heather was allegedly involved in an affair with a Northrop executive. John contacted Northrop's ethics department in July of 2018 to inform them that he possessed documents showing Heather, a director of global business development and Northrop recruitment and executive and, and an executive fraudulently billed the company for business travel. However, they were engaged in tens of thousands of dollars of personal travel that involved cheating on them. So that's what the complaint said. Right. And it's basically like. What he's talking about is. It's like Excel spreadsheets, like Excel spreadsheets are not porn. I'm sure that's like somebody's kink out there. Maybe maybe somebody is just like, boy, those spreadsheets really get me rock hard or whatever. Like that's that I'm not here to kink shame anything, but like it in in most cases, something like that is not like pornographic material, like possessed documents could literally be like receipts and credit card bills or so on and so forth, like stuff like financial reports and things of that sort. It's not revenge porn. So Northrop Grumman uh, hired a detective and uh, and and they came in to basically search John's home illegally. <laughs> violating the Fourth Amendment because they had no rhyme or reason to actually go about fucking doing this. And uh, they they searched his home without any real proof of revenge porn, going over the the notions of possessed documents, right? Like what like they use that vague term and they basically said, oh, he's trying to leverage and blackmail this person, which is not true. He's essentially pointing out um, internal fraud within their company, 
you're like a multi-billion dollar company and there is internal fraud with two higher ups in your company, two executives in your company. Um, and, you know, in terms of being a fucking company, that would should be something that concerns you. Uh, there, I mean, they, there was none. They found like a bikini photo or some shit that she sent to the Northrop executive. And like that doesn't constitute as anything. You know, like so, it, none of this is uh, is really applicable. But here's the thing: Northrop Grumman has a history of attacking whistleblowers. They do that shit all the time. They falsely accuse people, and then they settle out of court. And they basically say that the whistleblower doesn't can't can't say or do anything. Right? That's just sort of like a thing that they do. Um, these false accusations uh, essentially took John's kids away from him which is so fucked up and they also took his vespa which is like uh can you can can we do can can you just keep the vespa and give the guy his kids like like take the fucking vespa who gives it's a vespa it'll be fine but can you can you let the guy have his children like that's can that be can that be a thing like can you guys not be a total fucking dick about this so now, um, you know, John is seeking damages for emotional duress. Um, and I hope, I hope that he wins uh, because this is bullshit. And, like, this is essentially a war profiteering company uh, using their massive wealth to go after a, a writer, a uh, commentator on foreign policy and the intelligence community with his radio show, with his independently funded radio show, by the way. It's not like on fucking NPR or CNN or any of those other fucking networks. It's an independent radio show. And they and they're and they're like excited about going after these people. This is this is who these war profiteers are. This is who funds are like whenever people come out and say that they're anti-war, this is who we're fucking against. We're against people like this. People like Northrop Grumman. Not veterans like we're pro veteran because we're like hey maybe fucking help out the people that went to war and fought rich people's wars maybe you should fucking help them out this is who you should be against by the way there is no I, to me there is no possible way for anybody to justifiably make an argument uh on behalf of northrop Grumman. there just isn't <laughs> All of the evidence points to the fact that they fucked over John Kiriakou for no, for no reason other than the fact that he is a CIA whistleblower, he uh, talks about foreign policy and the intelligence community quite often, and he writes about it. And this is how they're coming after him. This is how they're going to try to punish him. And this is, this is a tactic that's been used before. We saw this with you know Black Panthers, MLK, Malcolm X, all these like the FBI and the intelligence community always goes after them. They always go after the families. They always try to find this thing and where they where they come out and like with King, they like found letters uh, with his uh, with his like former uh, you know because he had infidelity like he cheated on his wife too and and they were like oh you're fucking done blah 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 and they would threaten him and shit like that. Uh, and they were, like, sending letters between Eldridge Cleaver and Huey Newton, which are for the Black Panthers. And, like, this is what they do. They, they sow this sort of divide, and then they hang you up in legal fees, which, which is what they did with the Panthers, too. Um, I did a whole video about it that, that's on the YouTube channel that kind of outlines the history of, of the Black Panthers and how the intelligence community really fucked them over. But this is a typical thing that they do. So when people sit there and, like, justify the intelligence community and like glorify them for what they are it's like you're glorifying people that went after grassroots movements that are going after independent people speaking out against government atrocities that's that's who you want to fucking support that's fucking bananas to me that's fucking bananas to me All right, our second story uh, comes from our friends uh, in, in Carbondale. Uh, I had a friend in Carbondale uh, who's part of Carbondale Springs sent this to me. Um, and, you know, they're involved in a lot of activists, uh, activist movements and protests and things of that sort. Uh, real grassroots stuff. 
and uh, um, you know all this stuff happened. Uh, let me look at the date of this article real quick. Uh, end of June, June thirtieth is when this happened, when this story was released, right? Uh, and I was trying to get them on the podcast last week, uh, and all this stuff was going on. Uh, what, what what we're just about to get into, and uh, you know at that point I was just like, yo you need to take some time to just be you like take time to get that get your head right you know relax like veg out watch some shit uh da, 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 da. Uh, but they sent me this article and when i read it i was like this is something i feel like i need to talk about um so basically what happened in in carbondale is that uh, they're claiming police stations were vandalized ooh because people put you know signs about defunding the police and uh things of that sort so Let's, uh, let me see if this will pop up. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so you can see, like, they posted, like, defund the police, defund CPD. Uh, they were, there was an American flag that was burned, but it was nonviolent. Um, you know, people were sharing stories, and there was, and this is how kind of funny is, like, there's just one cop cleaning everything up, uh, and, and then they arrested this woman. Um, so during the protest, basically what happened is, I apologize if I uh, don't pronounce her name properly, but a trans woman by the name of Kat Brufok, Brufo. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that last name properly. Uh, but she was arrested for spraying graffiti at the protest, at a defund the police protest, right? She was spraying graffiti uh, and, uh, and, and she got arrested. The cops showed up and they were like, oh, you're, this is criminal vandalism, blah, 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 blah. And they arrested her. And then three protesters approached the cops, and then the cops turned around and pepper sprayed them. All they wanted to know is why she was being arrested. Then the police reports call her by the wrong name. Because she's a trans woman, they called her by Thomas, which is essentially, I believe, called dead naming. Like, they, they, and cor please do correct me if, if I'm not using that terminology. Uh, correctly or, or in, in, in the most appropriate way, but they used the wrong name. They didn't put Cat down. They put Thomas down, and which is like kind of it was just super disrespectful, especially if you know that that person is a trans person, which I assume you do when you arrested them. And you know there is a better way to kind of show respect to the trans community. There really is. You could say you could you could have come out and said something. Like, hey, you know, this is a this is a trans person. They go by cat, but on the records, currently on the records, their name is Thomas, right? And and I I don't want to keep trying to pronounce the last name and and fuck it up because I probably will, and people have fucked up my name a bunch, and I don't want to do that to this person. So, um, you know, you could have gone about doing that in a, in a very cordial and respectful way. But you didn't. Not only that, you pepper sprayed a bunch of people that were just trying to figure out what happened. So then that escalated things and they got angry and they started like throwing shit at the cop car to fucking get this trans person out. And all this trans person was doing, by the way, was graffiti. And it's called criminal vandalism. Why is this a fucking law? Criminal vandalism is something that needs to have somebody put in handcuffs and taken to jail. Killer cops are still on the loose. Like we have basically gotten to the point in our society where, where some kind of art, and I do believe graffiti is art, even if it's, you know, just kind of spray, it, it's, it might be a little lower level art, but it's still art uh, by all, all intents and purposes, is considered more of a jailable offense than killer cops, than cops murdering civilians. That's where we're at in our society right now. Do you understand why people like are out in the streets protesting for things to change? That's such a crazy fucking thing to me. Why is graffiti a bigger threat than these murdering cops or the military industrial complex that is that has created genocides for the sake of profit but graffiti is the thing writing defund the police or 
fuck the CPD or what have you is far more. And I remember having a conversation about this with somebody uh, years ago. I, um, I was in a car with somebody very conservative, right? Uh, he was another comic. I'm not going to say his name, but super conservative comic. And the, I spent four days in the car with this dude. Uh, but by the second day, I was just like, this guy's trying to goat me into having an argument with him because he, he, I think he thrived on arguments. But one of the things he mentioned, we were passing some rock faces in Wisconsin. There's some graffiti on it, right? Some of the some of the graffiti was message oriented. Some of the graffiti was just like signs, right? Signatures of people, as as sometimes graffiti does. And uh, and I was like, yeah, man, that's really cool. And he was like, oh, you think that's cool? And I was like, yeah, I think that's rad. And he goes, really? You don't think that's damaging the building? And I was like, man, if somebody is really that upset about it, then I don't know. We make them paint the building. You know, but like it's art to me. And he was like, oh, you think it's art? You think it's art and not destruction? And I was like, no, it's not destruction. Like, what are you talking about? And he was like, you know, I think that's destruction. You've destroyed that building. Nobody asked you to put that graffiti up. Nobody asked you to put that art up. Nobody asked for that message on their on their property. And and if you if you do something like that, I think if you get caught graffitiing, I think you need to have a bullet put between your eyes. That's what this fucking dude said to me. And I just kind of was like, okay, psycho. Uh, that's crazy. But that's what people think. Like, they think graffiti is such a over-the-top crime that they believe that these people need to be harmed and they need, they and, and you know, taught a lesson or what like whatever it's it's fucking bananas to me man like graffiti should not be an arrestable offense graffiti is like one of those offenses where let's say you graffiti a building and that owner goes you know i really didn't want this here and uh they look at it and they go well it's billy down the street and billy comes up and he goes yeah I, you know i was feeling inspired i saw this building it cre you know i did this thing and they go well you know uh, Mr. Jenkins, whatever, it doesn't fucking want this on his building. Instead of, like, sending Billy to jail, putting some sort of bail on them, pepper spraying Billy's friends, why not just have Billy paint the fucking building? He got to do his art. Jenkins didn't want the art. And now it's like, all right, I'll spend the next Saturday afternoon fucking painting the thing. And maybe by that time, right, like maybe by that time, the community comes together and it's like, Mr. Jenkins, this is actually a pretty fucking cool ass piece of art and it makes people want to come to your business more. And then maybe Jenkins has a change of heart, da da da. Like, but putting somebody in jail, like, I think I just wrote a movie, you guys. I think I just wrote like a pretty, pretty awesome, uh, like, this is what Lifetime movie should be about. Uh, not about fucking, how are we going to save Christmas? Is fuck that. Christmas will be fine. It's the most materialistic holiday uh, on record. Anyway, uh, I think this graffiti movie, uh, you know, if Hallmark wants to come talk to me about it, uh, throw a number down and, uh, and, uh, and we'll figure it out. We'll try to finance this graffiti movie. Uh, Billy and the Jenkins. Billy and the Jenkins, we'll call it. Uh, work and title. It's a work and title, guys. I just came up with this idea like 10 seconds ago. Give me, give me a little bit of a break, okay? But... <laughs> But this is not, I mean, this is the thing is like we have these fucking laws in place that are just over the top and ridiculous and don't make any goddamn sense. And this is one of them. This this person, Kat, should not be in prison for graffitiing them. Should they, they should not have gotten arrested for this. Those other protesters did not need to get pepper sprayed for this. The funniest image of all of that to me is the lone cop like peeling down to fund the police. Who knows? Maybe that cop like gets it now. Maybe as he was taking all those all those things down, you know, he gets it. And he's just like, oh, man, like I like I'm the asshole in this situation. I've been the one that's not been serving my community properly. And on that note. 
our final story also involves uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of a police update. Uh, the Minneapolis police is uh, or Minneapolis is set to replace their police in their city. Uh, I I know I've been talking a lot about the uh, the situation in Minneapolis. Um, if, if anybody is uh, you know new and watching this and hasn't seen my prior videos about uh, what's going on in Minneapolis, um, obviously this this all surrounds the. Uh, the murder of George Floyd by uh, Derek Chauvin. Um, we had Jacob Fry, who like didn't, who basically came out and said he's not going to uh, defund the police. Uh, he after he made these grandstand statements about how su he supports the black community and so on and so forth. This, that, and the third. Um, and uh, you know they basically w w protested, and you had organizations like Black Visions Collective, which was one of the first organizations that I donated to with the Citizen Revolution shows, um, Reclaim the Block, and you know a bunch of these other grassroots organizations that organized all of these protests uh, or, or were kind of for, in the forefront of the movement and uh, essentially went to city council and said, this is what we want. We want to defund the police. Here's a plan of what we can do after we defund the police and how we can fund something that's, uh, that's way better. And now where we're at is, um, so, so the last video that I, I talked about, like the thing that they put out, they put out a, a, um, a document essentially that outlined what they want to do and why the police is a problem and how they would want to replace and update the police so that it would, it makes a lot more sense. And it is kind of focused on community safety and community, um, com com like rebuilding these communities, right? City Council, 12 to 0 City Council vote to defund and replace the police of Minneapolis. 12 to 0 is where they're at. So now they're starting the process of doing that, of defunding and replacing the police. What they want to replace the police department with is instead of calling it the police, it's going to be the Department of Community Safety and Violence Prevention. Honestly, like if you're somebody that's out there and it's just like, just defund the police movement, it's fucking, this is bullshit. Blah, 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 blah. You know, how how can you really justify a department that's about community safety and violence prevention, which the cops don't do? We just talked about a story of a, a, a trans woman getting arrested and then people getting pepper sprayed by the cops for graffiti. Like, this is not violence protection, uh, prevention or community safety. So what this would involve is... Um, is basically what we've been talking about on this channel with the, with, with, the, I, with the notion of policing, which is compartmentalizing the job of the police. So instead of like policing, uh, like, you know, these big fucking uh, roided up b dudes in fucking battle armor coming out, um, you employ peace, peace officers. Now, by the way, this doesn't mean that when there is a violent crime that you don't bring out people with riot shields and guns and stuff, but you bring that out knowing that there is a violent situation at hand, right? Like there is somebody that's armed. Um, this fucking minority report world of, well, we have to assume that everybody is armed and everybody is uh, ter like just a, um, an evil son of a bitch and they're out to kill you and out to get you. It's like, that's how, that's what they drill into the cops heads in the training program. And it makes it cops versus citizens. So everybody is their enemy. So there is no protection and there is no safety when you think everybody is your enemy. That's just paranoia. So if you train a police force to think within the terms of paranoia, yeah, you're going to get a bunch of fucking people shot because they think that their, their lives are in danger all the time because that's what they're told. So um, if you employ peace officers, uh, these peace officers could be, you know, um, people that know how to counsel domestic abuse situations, people that know how to deal with the mentally ill, people that know how to, um, you know, help people in terms of, uh, um, like, medicine and stuff. Like, if somebody's injured and they need to be taken, like, it's, it's stuff like that where you really don't need a police officer with a gun to show up and take care of the situation. You need somebody to talk to them. You need somebody to apply first aid. You need somebody to mediate the situation you need somebody to uh you know p play the middle person in in a particular situation not a dude with a gun that's going to threaten to take you to prison forever uh that's craziness so 
not just that, but um, this is something that I didn't see in the article that I read, but I do think we would also need a um, citizen oversight committee, which would involve, and Ron Placone has also talked about this, by the way, but a citizen oversight committee would be like, it's not somebody in law enforcement, it's people like you and me. We would kind of look over the situation, we would sort of look over the case, and it would it would be sort of a morality situation. It would be like an ethics situation, right? It would be something that we would look at and go, well, here's the situation, here's all the things that we need to consider, here's what the peace officer did, here's what the here's what the actual police did when things got things started escalating a little bit more. And was the police right to do that? Was this person right to do that? How would this how does the punishment fit the crime kind of situation? So, you know, it's like Again, it's like people that fucking graffiti aren't going to go to prison. They're going to be like, you just paint the wall, dude. And like ask permission. It's cool to ask. It's fine to ask permission. I get it. Just say you're sorry, paint the wall. And the next time you feel inspired, just go into the business and be like, hey, I got this idea for this mural. I don't want to get, in, you know, like just do. It's going to be fine. Like graffiti is supposed to be art. Sometimes it's going to be OK without doing it without permission. Sometimes it's not going to be okay to do it without permission. So. It's stuff like that, like that you can have an oversight committee that is essentially people from the people from your community that are going to be part of that. Uh, what they're saying that this department, uh, Department of Community Safety and Violence Prevention, would do is have a holistic public health oriented approach. So it's really about taking care of the public. It's it is about serving and protecting the public. Like the side of every fucking cop car says that they just ignore and don't fucking do, right? Now, um, this measure, uh, once it's put together by city council, and again, 12, 12, 0, 12 to 0 uh, to, to go forward with this, uh, it'll have to pass and be approved by city council again by August 21st. So they have to August 21st. They have about a, a little over a month. Um, so, you know, this article was posted, I think, also end of June. Yeah, so end of June. So they have about two months to get this thing written and put out there as a piece of legislation for the city. But here's the thing. Mayor Jacob Fry, who, as I mentioned at the top of the segment, um, has basically said that he will not support defunding the police, uh, does have the power to veto it. And if he does, he basically came out and said that about a month ago. Uh, and there's a pretty embarrassing video of him where they're like telling him to go home. I mean, it's like thousands of people yelling, go home, Jacob, go home. It's pretty, it's kind of hilarious. But if he does, if he does veto it, he's not getting reelected. He's not getting reelected. That's the end of his political career. That's the end of him making how much ever fucking hundreds of thousands of dollars and whatever back ends he's getting. It's done. He's done. Game over. You lose, bro. He won't get reelected. So, you know, I want to keep, I think we should all be keeping an eye on this story, on this situation. It's very important to do that for all of us. And, uh, and it's good to keep pressure because here's the thing. All of this is a result of constant pushback, protesting and organizing from grassroots organizations, from grassroots movements run by regular people, not funded by corporations, but funded by all of us to push and get legislative change. That's how this happened. Because we kept the pressure on them to say, this is what we want on the legislative end. We are willing to work with you on a legislative end. We don't want things to escalate any further. And the city council in Minneapolis is listening. So I think we, I mean, we could do this nationwide and get this thing done. And this is really change that's coming from the bottom up. That's what this really is. It's change coming from the bottom up. And, you know, people don't, people, people normally don't recognize that sort of thing. Like that sort of thing isn't particularly pointed out to people all the time. But this is a bottom up change. And this is, this is how you drive change. You don't drive change from the top down. You drive change from the bottom up. And that's what we're seeing here. This is incredible. This is a very powerful movement, and we need to keep on it, right? Don't, don't, don't look at these distractions of painting streets and saying that's enough. The painting the streets is fine. It's great. Thank you for doing it. It's a, very, it's a very nice measure, 
But we need some more. It's time for action along with these theatrics that you like to throw at us. The theatrics are nice. Thank you. Cool. I Great. It's glad, I'm glad that you're uh, acknowledging that, but we need some action. And that's what's happening now. And that's because of the constant pressure and the pushback and the protesting and people speaking out and people listening to each other and people sharing this type of shit and getting the word out about this. And the more people talk about it, the more things like this will happen. And that's why we keep pushing for a general strike. That's why we keep pushing for a rent strike, because that's how we fundamentally start getting some radical change that we absolutely need in this country. I'm very excited about this. All right, folks, that is, uh, that is it. That is all. Uh, those are the three stories to cover today. Um, I will probably try to do one, one more uh, in the next, maybe, maybe in the next few days or so, something similar like this. There's a couple of the stories that I would like to, like to get to uh, and, and you know, post about and stuff, um, shine a light on. Uh, if you do enjoy this stuff, if you do enjoy my content, I very, very much would uh, appreciate it if you guys hit that like button, hit the share button, and make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. Uh, if you would like to support my work, you can uh, do so by becoming a sustaining member, making one-time donations, downloading or purchasing an album, that, that's very helpful, um, or uh, getting tickets to the live virtual stand-up comedy shows, the Citizen Revolution virtual uh, live stand-up comedy shows. Boom, there's that poster again. Um, basically, I'm, I'm donating half of my uh, ticket sales to grassroots organizations, uh, and, uh, and, and half of that is, is, is going to basically keeping me alive and putting food on the table and making sure that my bills are paid. <laughs> so um, I, a lot of people are, are, have become regular, uh, regulars in, in, in these shows, and I very much appreciate them and love them. Uh, for doing so, and if you would like to become that regular, you have an opportunity right there. Um, the ticket links are in the description, or all of this stuff, by the way, the donations, the album, and the tickets for these shows uh, are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A dot com. Uh, a, you know, a, a, I'm working on sprucing the site up, you guys. I'm working on sprucing that site up. Uh, so I hope, uh, I hope you guys go there. I hope you guys check it out. Uh, I hope you guys will come to these shows. Uh, I'm very excited about them. Um, and it, it keeps me writing and I'm very excited about the topics that we're talking about. I'm very excited that you guys are like, there are people that are super jazzed about the topics that I'm talking about, um, because it's not like normal topics to talk about and stuff. So, um, yeah, I really, really appreciate you guys uh, supporting the show, supporting my work, and I hope that you guys will continue to do so. Um, more videos are coming, so make sure that you guys are subscribed to the channel. And uh, till the next one, thank you so much, and we'll see you on the road.